I went to see Tatum in Canada. She was making a film there with Richard Burton. And I was in my room and she was walking with my brother in the street and she saw Lee Majors. And I just think that uh, if she had never met us, would she still be alive today? Now, I knew who she was. She had, was a Charlie's Angels, but I hadn't seen Charlie's Angels. I didn't know the intensity of her popularity. The atmosphere in Hollywood turned solemn on December 8, 2023, as news of Ryan O'Neill's passing spread. Despite facing his final moments, he openly discussed his wife, shedding light on the circumstances surrounding Farrah Fawcett's fate. So let's get started to know what he said. Patrick O'Neill, the son of the beloved Love Story star, officially confirmed his father's passing on the same day through an Instagram post. In the heartfelt caption, he shared the difficult news and expressed the profound impact his father had on him and his wife, Summer. So this is the toughest thing I've ever had to say, but here we go. My dad passed away peacefully today, with his loving team by his side supporting him and loving him as he would us, began his caption. This is very difficult for my wife, Summer, and I, but I will share some feelings to give you an idea of how great a man he is. Describing his late father as his hero, Patrick O'Neill expressed deep admiration for Ryan O'Neill's extensive entertainment career. My father, Ryan O'Neill, has always been my hero. I looked up to him, and he was always bigger than life, Patrick shared. He went on to highlight the timeline of his own life, noting that when he was born in 1967, his father was actively starring in Peyton Place. Ryan O'Neill's illustrious career included notable works such as Barry Lyndon, Paper Moon, What's Up Doc, and others. In 1963, Ryan O'Neill entered matrimony with his first wife, Joanna Moore. Their union endured for four years, producing two children. Joanna, a celebrated actress in Hollywood known for her roles in Monster on the Campus and Walk on the Wild Side, shared a deep connection with Ryan. Despite parting ways in 1967, their love story resulted in the birth of their first child, daughter Tatum O'Neill, in 1963, followed by the arrival of their son, Griffin O'Neill, the next year. In the same year as his divorce from Joanna, Ryan embarked on a new chapter with actress Lee Taylor Young, now 78. Their marriage, lasting from 1967 to 1974, was both his longest and final one, as Ryan chose not to remarry following their separation. The couple welcomed their son, Patrick, in 1967. While Patrick doesn't frequently share pictures of his mother, he took to Instagram in January 2020 to celebrate Lee's 75th birthday, expressing admiration and fondness. In the caption, he wrote, A happy birthday shout-out to my mom, Spiritaltai, turning 75 today. Back in the day with this shot, it's as if me and the other guy went shirt shopping together. Anyway, serious hold working on that hair. And mom looks great then now. And always. On February 14th, the star of Bones shared a poignant tribute by posting a photo of the late Charlie's Angels star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Accompanying the image was a caption that resonated with enduring love, my forever Valentine. Even nearly 15 years after Farrah Fawcett's passing in 2009, Ryan O'Neill remained captivated by the memory of his former love and was unafraid to express it openly. Their paths first crossed in 1979, sparking a passionate affair that unfolded over the course of decades, both on and off the stage. Throughout their enduring relationship, they not only shared a life and a child, but also graced the television screen together, leaving an indelible mark on each other's lives. Their connection was marked by profound dedication that transcended the passage of time. And she ran up to him and she said, my, my dad's Ryan O'Neill, you're friends. He said, yeah, well, where is he? He's in his room, call him, here's his room number. I said, I told him, why'd you do that? I don't like him. But how did this story begin? Five years after his divorce, Ryan O'Neill found himself single when his friend Lee Majors, known for his role in The Six Million Dollar Man, extended an invitation for dinner. The allure was a home-cooked meal prepared by Majors' wife, Farrah Fawcett. In this unexpected encounter, O'Neill was instantly captivated by Fawcett's breathtaking presence, as he later shared on The Late Late Show. She had, was a Charlie's Angels, but I hadn't seen Charlie's Angels. I didn't know the intensity of her popularity, not really. I'm a, it was a snob, you know, Mara movies. Recalling the situation, O'Neill noted that the relationship between Fawcett and Majors appeared to be strained. Seizing an opportunity when Majors was out of town, O'Neill mustered the courage to invite Fawcett to join him to see a musician they both admired. This marked the beginning of a connection that would evolve into a significant chapter in both of their lives. So um, I went and I played, and there she was in the driveway. My God, she was breathtaking. Hey. I, Who's that? He said, that's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> 
When they reunited, sparks ignited between them. The actor from Paper Moon candidly shared with TV Guide, as reported by LA Times, We sat and kissed and kissed until our lips were bloody. I could have gone on kissing her for a year. The following night escalated the intensity as the two shared a bed, creating an even more electric connection. At the time, Fawcett's marriage to Majors was already in a downward spiral, and her magnetic chemistry with O'Neill became the catalyst for the end of her marriage. The couple officially separated that same year and finalized their divorce in 1982. Reflecting on those early days of their relationship, Fawcett, in an interview with Life magazine as shared by People, recalled, I was so overwhelmed by this mental and physical attraction for him that I didn't think about anything except what was happening right there. Their connection marked a significant turning point in both of their lives. The love affair between Ryan O'Neill and Farrah Fawcett continued, and in a 1981 interview with People, the The Burning Bed actor shared that their relationship went beyond the physical. Ryan is the most honest person I know, Fawcett said. He's helped me be more independent by being the greatest ego booster I've ever had. I think our personalities are well suited. In January 1985, Fawcett and O'Neill welcomed their first and only child, a son named Redmond, solidifying their well-suited partnership. Despite their enduring romance and growing family, the two actors chose not to marry, with O'Neill expressing to Vanity Fair years later, We never really considered it. We didn't want to conform to societal expectations. We were rebels. However, they recognized the public's fascination with their connection and decided to capitalize on it by starring together in the successful 1989 television miniseries, Small Sacrifices. This drama garnered significant acclaim, earning three Primetime Emmy nominations. Hoping to replicate their on-screen magic, O'Neill and Fawcett ventured into a 1991 TV sitcom titled Good Sports, where they portrayed bickering sports anchors, drawing from their own experiences. Unfortunately, the sitcom lasted only one season, marking a contrast to their earlier triumph in small sacrifices. My agent called and said, I have good news and I have bad news. The script is really good. I said, damn it! It's good, you know, because usually you want a script to be good. And this one I kept saying, oh, maybe it won't be good. Ryan O'Neill and Farrah Fawcett had an intense relationship, filled with emotion that surfaced in a variety of ways. They fought and loved with passion, Sylvia Dorsey, a close friend of the couple, told People. It was never boring. They were electric together. Arguments were the norm for the two actors, sometimes bordering on dangerous. In 2012, O'Neill wrote a book, Both of Us, My Life with Farrah, in which he detailed their relationship, including their epic fighting matches. He revealed an incident in which the couple were having a heated argument, and their young son had to step in. The Hollywood Reporter shared the story from his book. Suddenly, our six-year-old son is standing in the doorway in his Winnie the Pooh pajamas staring at us. He's holding a butcher's knife. He points the tip of the blade at his chest. I'm going to stab myself if you don't stop it. That ended the argument. The couple's relationship ultimately came to an end in 1997, when Fawcett, intending to surprise O'Neill on Valentine's Day, discovered him in bed with another woman. Despite the breakup, their separation was brief, and they reconciled in 2001 after O'Neill was diagnosed with cancer. ABC News reported the actor saying, I called her, and it broke the ice. Fawcett supported him through his treatments and remained by his side after he went into remission. Unfortunately, their roles reversed when Fawcett was diagnosed with anal cancer in 2006. He's never given up, and uh, this whole journey, you know, I think part of what's gotten Farah through is her faith and her inner strength and her sense of humor. Which yes. Despite a period of remission, Fawcett's health deteriorated, leading to her return to the hospital before her passing in June 2009. O'Neill stood by her throughout, expressing to USA Today that he sought forgiveness during her final days, saying, I asked her to forgive me, forgive me for everything, I still ask her that. O'Neill also disclosed that he proposed to Fawcett, and she accepted. However, their plans for marriage were thwarted. When a priest arrived at the hospital for the ceremony, he administered the last rites to Fawcett instead. She was subsequently taken off life support and passed away the following day. Alana Stewart, one of Fawcett's close friends, revealed to Vanity Fair, she's always been the real love of his life, and he's always been the real love of her life. She never stopped loving him. In the years following Farrah Fawcett's passing, Ryan O'Neill has been transparent about his enduring love for her. In a 2019 interview with People, he expressed, There was never a day I didn't love her. Despite his previous reputation as a ladies' man, O'Neill never re 
remarried and refrained from pursuing serious relationships after Fawcett's death in 2009. O'Neill consistently pays tribute to Fawcett on Instagram, sharing photos from their shared moments. In one post, he declared, forever happy birthday, baby. And in another, 10 years since she passed, but forever she is with me. I love you, baby. These posts serve as a poignant testament to his unwavering devotion to the love of his life. Jacqueline Smith, Fawcett's co-star in Charlie's Angels and a longtime friend, provided insight into their relationship, telling people, Ryan was the love of her life, and she, his. Whether they had a fight or were back together, it was always Ryan. O'Neill's commitment to preserving Fawcett's memory reflects the profound impact she had on his life. However, people believe that Ryan's obsession with Farrah was natural because her life was not easy. Farrah Fawcett was an American obsession, long before the Kardashians reigned supreme and the world fawned over stars like Scarlett Johansson, Margot Robbie, and Jennifer Lawrence. There's no denying the fact that the 70s pinup girl and actress was a huge celebrity in her time. Remembered for her role as Jill in the 1970s TV series Charlie's Angels, her world-famous swimsuit poster, and of course her iconic feathered hair, it's clear that Fawcett was once the ultimate starlet, admired and loved by people everywhere, as noted by the Los Angeles Times after her death at the age of 62 in 2009, following a battle with cancer. It's hard to imagine Farrah Fawcett ever wanting to do anything other than perform and create art. However, as a child, her interests led her in a very different direction. For a little while, she actually considered being a nun. As she told Brian Linehan in a 1979 interview, I think I only wanted to be a nun for about a week. It was a week. Fawcett once shared her initial belief that becoming a nun would offer an easy and uncomplicated life, stemming from her Catholic school background. As she grappled with emerging feelings towards men and the confusion surrounding societal expectations, she briefly considered joining a convent to suppress these emotions. However, as Fawcett humorously admitted, that resolve lasted only a week. Her allure wasn't confined to her fame. Fawcett's beauty had been recognized since childhood. According to her mother, strangers in stores would marvel at her daughter, describing her as an A-N-G-E-L. Fawcett, recalling neighbors staring at her during her youth, expressed a desire to avoid such attention, feeling self-conscious about the constant scrutiny. She said, why don't you do the chic of Araby for the talent part? And I did. That's heaven. Absolute heaven. Don't change a single solitary thing. Her stunning looks continued to captivate throughout high school, where classmates voted her most beautiful for three consecutive years. Even upon entering Texas University, Fawcett secured the same title in her freshman year, a rare achievement, as noted by Texas Monthly. This recognition catapulted her into a kind of mini-celebrity status, prompting young men to embark on weekend trips across Texas in the hopes of catching a glimpse of the captivating Fawcett. If social media had existed during her youth, one can easily envision her amassing an impressive Instagram following. Farrah Fawcett's burgeoning fame during her college years attracted the attention of a prominent Hollywood agent. A photograph of the rising star reached David Mirish, a renowned Los Angeles publicist with a clientele that included Perry Como, Pat Boone, and Omar Sharif. Mirish, eager to bring Fawcett to Hollywood, contacted her at school, attempting to persuade her to leave university and pursue a career in the entertainment industry. Fawcett, in response, requested Mirish to speak with her father. However, undeterred, Mirish persisted with his efforts, leading to a series of persistent phone calls. Yes, but a little need, you know, there's a little room for improvement. But you're never supposed to say that. Oh, well, I think it's very good. It's just that... <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. But Eventually, Fawcett relented and accepted Mirish's offer as she completed her junior year. To kickstart her journey, she had a photo shoot in a Texas park arranged by a photographer from Texas Student Publications. Initially intended as a temporary move to Hollywood with plans to return for her senior year, Fawcett's trajectory in the entertainment industry took a different course, and she never went back to complete her college education. Before achieving household fame, Farrah Fawcett left a lasting impression on the reality show, The Dating Game. This ABC series featured three men answering questions from behind a screen, and the woman would ultimately choose one for a date, as highlighted by Mental Floss. Number three, if you were in charge of everything, what would you make the national pastime? Oh, I would make the national pastime just love. In this memorable episode, Fawcett selected Bachelor No. 2, leading to an unexpected and seemingly spontaneous fistfight among the three hopeful men. However, the twist was later revealed. The entire brawl was planned. 
Every move in the fight was choreographed, turning the incident into a staged spectacle. Despite its scripted nature, the orchestrated chaos added a layer of entertainment to the show and served as an early indication of how Hollywood producers were positioning Fawcett as a woman so captivating that men would go to extremes for her attention. Farrah Fawcett's first real brush with fame came when she appeared on a now iconic poster. In the famous image, a smiling Fawcett is sitting while wearing a red one-piece swimsuit, her long, bouncy blonde hair framing her face. The poster sold millions of copies around the world. Dwight Bowers, a curator for the Smithsonian, spoke to the Washington Times about the poster, claiming that it came to symbolize the 1970s. As Robert Thompson, professor of television and popular culture, told the Los Angeles Times, if you were to list 10 images that are evocative of American pop culture, Farrah Fawcett would be one of them. However, the iconic poster featuring Farrah Fawcett might have taken a different visual direction if not for Fawcett's stylistic choices. In a 2009 interview with Entertainment Weekly, the photographer behind the poster, Bruce McBroom, revealed that a bikini had initially been requested for the shoot. However, Fawcett informed McBroom that she didn't have one with her. In a spontaneous decision, she pulled out a red bathing suit, which ultimately became the now famous centerpiece of the poster. Even though Farrah Fawcett became immensely popular after her role in Charlie's Angels, she wasn't usually considered a serious, hard-hitting actress. That is, until the star took over a lead role in the off-Broadway play Extremities. The Los Angeles Times recounted her surprising theatrical debut in 1983. Fawcett replaced Susan Sarandon and played the challenging role of a S-assault victim who gets revenge on her assailant. She ended up getting some of the best reviews of her career. In 1986, she reprised the role in the feature film and won herself a Golden Globe nomination for Best Actress in a Drama, proving once and for all that she was much more than just a pretty face. Unfortunately, her only other foray into theater occurred in 2003 and ended in disaster. Fawcett was playing the lead role in a Broadway play called Bobby Boland. However, the production was canceled after just one week of previews. According to the New York Post, Fawcett wasn't so impressive in her second play, with audience members reporting that she flubbed her lines and forgot the name of her husband's character. Despite her early acclaim as a beloved star, Farrah Fawcett experienced a decline in popularity during the late 80s and 90s. Los Angeles Magazine detailed how her tumultuous family life and relationship with Ryan O'Neill had cast a shadow on her image as the epitome of youth and health. Her career also waned, leading to a string of TV movie appearances. In 1997, Fawcett's notorious appearance on The Late Show with David Letterman drew attention. Described by Los Angeles Magazine as a spaced-out aging S symbol, her seemingly incoherent demeanor fueled suspicions of drug abuse among viewers. For years, she graced television, movies, magazines, and millions of posters as one of the most famous symbols this country has ever seen. The interview was challenging to witness, and many speculated about possible substance abuse issues. However, in a 2009 Vanity Fair interview, O'Neill refuted claims of Fawcett having a drug problem. He asserted that during her Letterman appearance, he believed she was acting. Regarding her Playboy shoot, he explained, she was selling Playboy magazine and she thought she was being Playmate-ish. In 2005, Farrah Fawcett ventured into reality television with her own series, Chasing Farrah, which aired on TV Land. Unfortunately, the show received predominantly negative or lukewarm reviews from various publications, including the Los Angeles Times and Variety. Critics lamented that the series failed to provide a comprehensive glimpse into the star's life. Despite Fawcett's reported charm and allure in the series, viewers were left with what Variety called a choppy and insufficient overview of Fawcett. A particularly scathing review by the New York Post criticized the show for its perceived dullness, stating that there was a lack of engaging content. You spend the entire half hour wondering why this show is even on TV in the first place. The promised juicy details about Fawcett's life and family never materialized on screen, resulting in the reality TV venture failing to gain traction. Farrah Fawcett, despite not being commonly associated with Motown, played an unexpected role in inspiring the famous song Midnight Train to Georgia, performed by Gladys Knight and the Pips. The story unfolds with country songwriter Jim Weatherly, a friend of Lee Majors, who happened to be married to Fawcett at the time. One evening, Weatherly called Majors, and Fawcett answered the phone. She shared that Majors had taken a midnight plane to Houston, as reported by the New York Post. When I first met Lee, I was a little more enthusiastic about 
Well, what's it all about? And mm -hmm. should we go to this party? I mean, of course, we get invitations that mm -hmm. stack up like that. Inspired by this phrase, Weatherly incorporated it into a song. However, when singer Sissy Houston got involved, she modified the lyric to the now iconic Midnight Train to Georgia, explaining that her people were originally from Georgia and didn't take planes but trains. My people are originally from Georgia, and they didn't take planes to Houston or anywhere else. They took trains. When Gladys Knight and the Pips recorded the song later that year, it soared to num dollar one, marking a significant chapter in music history. Farrah Fawcett may have found fame on Charlie's Angels, but it turns out the actor didn't actually want to stay on the 1976 show for too long. In fact, after just one season, she wanted to leave the show behind for good. One of the reasons may have had to do with money. At the time, she was reported to be making $5,000 an episode, and rumor had it that she wanted $75,000. Her manager, Jay Bernstein, denied that rumor, saying she simply wanted to leave. She is asking to leave, he told the Washington Post in 1977, and she feels that she does not have legal grounds to leave or it would not be honorable. Fawcett did quit the show that year. A lawsuit followed, in which she was sued for $7 million. The whole lawsuit almost sank me, she later told People in a 1979 interview. She added that the real reason she had walked away from the show was that she wanted to branch out from her typecasting. The industry was furious with me and hostile because I was a TVS symbol who wanted to be an actress, she said. People thought I was really pretentious, and for months no one would touch me. Fawcett did later agree to return to guest star on the show in seasons three and four. Farrah Fawcett had a more public passing than most, as explained by the New York Times. Her illness with cancer lasted for three difficult years. Unlike most people who would probably crave privacy, Fawcett opted to capture her final moments on film. NBC bought the rights to the footage for $1.5 million, and the film was broadcast in May 2009. While the footage was originally intended to illustrate the problems with American cancer treatment, producer Craig Nevius claimed that the project ended up being a contradiction of what the film was supposed to be. Despite the potentially exploitative nature of Farrah's story, it's clear Fawcett was unrelentingly brave and strong until the end. Speaking with people, her doctor, Dr. Lawrence Pirro, recalled her spirit and determination. She marched through her illness fearlessly, taking control of her decisions, he said. She was committed to fight all the way and as long as she could for all of the peace of life that she was entitled to. Her fans also believe that she has been one of the most celebrated actors of her times. One of them wrote, She's an icon and a truly beautiful woman inside and out. I idolized her in my youth, and now I love the memory of the outstanding woman she is. Another one added, She left her mark, may her soul rest in peace. I hope her son got his life back on track and that her loved ones came to terms with their loss. That's it for today. See you in the next video. Until then, goodbye.